great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Helen, Helen Gibson, well known to, to most of us here. And Helen taught in some schools for many years, um, gained a, a BA from the OU and an MA from the University of Kent. And since coming down to Dorset, as we all know, she's been very closely associated with the Society and has acted as secretary for the last six years. Yeah. She's also taken on the role of honorary curator yeah. of the Hardy Archive at the County Museum. Mm. Um, so, Actually, I'm not secretary now. I was secretary. a long time ago. <laughs> Mike Nixon is secretary. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Sorry. Anyway, um, Helen's going to give us an illustrated talk uh, on, the, uh, on the manuscript of the wood. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, I want to talk about the manuscript of the Woodlanders, which is housed at the Dorset County Museum. I'm very sorry to say that at the moment it is in storage and I haven't been able to get it out to put on display in the museum. However, we do have other manuscripts on display. We've got Satires of Circumstance, for one, and um, a part of Far From the Madding Crowd, and some other very interesting things on display. We're also celebrating the Woodlanders in the museum, and we've made a nice display, which we're going to put costumes in and various things at the moment. And there is a little cabinet with first editions and some photographs and a little bit about the dramatisation. So if you would like to visit the museum, I've made an arrangement with them that you can go without paying providing you wear your lanyard and you can go in and please will you make a donation um, it, it, I'm not specifying there's a, there's a box you can just put it in but if you'd like to think of it as um, a donation towards the funding and we're trying to raise the three million that we need for the Heritage Lottery Fund to kick into place so that we can develop the museum with the rest of the ten million or whatever it is. But we're, we're getting there, but every little helps. So if you would like to visit, lunchtime and tea time are probably going to be your only chance, but you can go in, show your badge, just put and say you'll put a donation in and then nip upstairs to the first floor, up the stairs, or by lift if you need to, and you you will find the Hardy Gallery up there. So that's where you can see other manuscripts and other lovely things. So back to the, um, the making of the Woodlanders. And of course, it was, it was interesting because at that time, Hardy had become so much in demand that he was asked by Macmillan's to produce another novel for their serial magazine. And so he was um, invited by them to do so. He called on them in London, but nothing was in writing so he was he, he was uh, a letter was received from I think it was Frederick Macmillan to say could they finalize the details and they would like it please by the following um, January I think they started on saying so this would have been January 1885 well at that time he was still writing the mayor of Casterbridge wasn't he so he said um, it was agreed that they had another um, book in the, in the wings waiting to go in and they would put that in and perhaps his would be ready by, by, um, you know, by March that year. Well, then he realised that... Um, I may have got my dates wrong, have I? Um, 1885 and 1886. He... Um, they realised that it would clash with the first printing in serial form in the graphic of the Mayor of Casterbridge. So they decided to delay it longer, which was good because it gave him time to get on and write it after all. And he was writing obviously flat out to do it. And in the end, it did, it did appear in Macmillan's magazine from May 1886 until... April 1887, and then as a three-decker novel on the 15th of March, it was published, um, and eight, uh, 15th of March 1887, and the single volume came out again in 1887. So we are celebrating in absolutely the right year, which is good. Um, now, the, um, I was just going to make, mention a few other things about the manuscript. It comprises nearly 500 pages, and it was written, at the, of course, it was written before the time of fountain pens, inkwell, and dip pens were all that there was. It, had traveled, it has travelled 
various parts of the country and across the, across the Atlantic with the first American publication in 1886. Or seven. It was sold by and bought by Howard Bliss, who then resold it, and it was bought back by Florence or Thomas Hardy. Fortunately, Hardy took Sidney Cockrell's advice, and it was bound up by Catherine Adams, who was um, a friend of, um, of, of William Morris's, a very good bookbinder, and so she bound up quite a few of the manuscripts, and Sidney Cockrell uh, invited and suggested that Hardy gave um, the manuscripts to where the um, collections around the country, including the Fitzwilliam of Cambridge, at Cambridge, of which he was the director. So, but he, his advice was a good one because we ended up in the museum in Dorchester having this marvellous edition. Um, and the, I'll just go on to the next slide because that does show you the back of the leather-bound manuscript in blue Morocco, faded somewhat, and that's the first writing now. He wrote The Woodlanders as the title, but actually he's written Fitzpiers of Hintock underneath it and just crossed it out. It's amazing how many, how many emendations and crossings out there are in the, in the manuscripts. So it's a very delicate object, really. It's all these years old, and the pages are thin and rather dry, and there's some loosening of the spine. So we are very, very careful about handling it now. So it is quite marvellous really that we have got that and other novels on in digital form so that those can be looked at predominantly these days and so I'm afraid that I've just brought excerpts from the uh, novel for this little presentation and then afterwards we will put on the full um, um, the full manuscript and it can roll around on the screen when we're not doing other things so we, we've got that so it is in every way an inspirational object, both in itself, for its age and its beauty, and mostly for the preservation of the original writing of the genius of the man who created the character's language and indeed the whole world of the woodlanders. So I think that's, that's my strong feeling about the, the significance of these wonderful manuscripts. And, you know, you, the actual idea of somebody writing all those words and creating it you're very close to the origins of the novel when you look at the real thing and I'm sorry that I haven't got it but you can go and see Satire's The Circumstance and other <coughs> manuscripts in the museum so putting a few of these things together I've chosen some of the um, excerpts from the novel I, I don't know how visible that's going to be, so I'll, perhaps I'll read it out. Um, it's the journey to get to Little Hintock is told us in great detail. And we are aware of how remote it is and what the journey is like. And we've got the barber Perkham, the man from the town, dressed up in his town clothes, and he's struggling to find it. And then he he's picked up by Mrs. Dollery's van, as you'll remember and uh, they eventually ride on. They rode till they turned into a half-invisible little lane, whence, as it reached the verge of an eminence, could be discerned in the dusk, about half a mile to the, to the right, gardens and orchards, sunk in a concave as, and it was, as, it, as it were snipped out of the woodland. From this self-contained place rose in stealthy silence, in stealthy silence st tall stems of smoke which the eye of imagination could trace downward to their root on quiet hearthstones festooned overhead with hams and flitches. It was one of those sequestered spots outside the gates of the world where may usually be found more meditation than action. And he goes on to say... Uh, more things that are there that imply a sort of a rather dreamy, inactive sort of place. And most of the people there are much associated with the, the surroundings. Oh, I did download some, ep some episodes, um, excerpts from the Gutenberg Library version online, which seemed a, an easier thing to do because. Various versions are 
different and people have taken some of the emendations and additions as Hardy put in and corrected and, and some of the, um, the punctuation has been corrected and it's much changed from the manuscript and some of the things that he put in are thought to be valuable and some are not and it's a question of judgment and I think um, probably the most authoritative thing I've read so far I don't know what Philip would say um, is Dale Kramer's book which is like a variorum edition of the Woodlanders and he has noted down in the, uh, at the bottom of each page the differences between manuscripts and the various versions. So it's, it's extremely detailed and, and very interesting. And there are various uh, additions that come in which elaborate and there are some things which are actually taken out. So it's a, a very... It, it reminds me of a play, really, because you, you have... In each performance of any written script, you have something unique. And in a way, with the different versions of a novel, it isn't such a static thing after all, because there are different things that occurred over the years as, uh, as history goes on. So then we have, coming into this sequestered space, the Doctor. A very clever young Doctor who, as they say, is in league with the devil, lives in the place you'll be going to. Not because there's somebody, there's anybody foreign to cure there, but because tis in the middle of his district. The observation was flung at the barber. Now, just above at the barber, it says bourgeois gentleman in pencil. Interesting. By one of the women at parting as a last attempt to get at his errand that way. Uh, they were trying to find out why the, why the barber's on the coach, as you'll remember, and they're listening in, but they can't quite understand why he's there. He's a professional uh, barber, he's not a journeying barber, and he's coming out to this remote place. Why? They don't find out. But he made her a reply, and without further pause, he went on. So there we are. And then we have, later on, a piece about Marty South, which we'll go on to. Here again, we have quite a lot of emendations, quite a lot of crossings out, and with the um, digital version, you can enlarge tremendously, so you can read underneath the, the crossings out. I'm not saying I can do it at the moment, but if I had a screen, I could, you know, you could, you can stretch it, which is brilliant, of course. So here we have, uh, have Marty, um, to whom the the journeyman, um, the, the barber is coming. On this one, and she's described as a woman with no particular beauty, but she's got this magnificent auburn hair. On this one bright gift of time to the particular victim of his now, victim of his now before us, the newcomer's eyes were fixed. Meanwhile, And meanwhile, the fingers of his right hand mechanically played on something sticking up from his waistcoat pocket, the bows of a pair of scissors, whose polish made them them perfectly responsive to the light from within. So you have this rather sinister scene, and Hardy wants to get it right, and so he's... He's changing various words as he goes through. And it's a wonderful scene because she's, she's sitting in the, in, the, in the house with the door open and the light and the heat from the fire is going out, but she has to have it open because, as she says, it's too smoky for her to work. And so she's working there, making the spars. And uh, Hardy says, itself, um, and, the, and the whole scene composed itself into a post raphaelite picture of extre- extre- oh, sorry, extreme, I can't read the word, anyway, something quality, wherein the girl's hair alone as the focus of observation was depicted with intensity and distinctiveness, and her face, shoulders, hands, opaque in every being, and every, uh, opaque, opaque in general, being blurred, being a blurred mass of unimportant detail, lost in large obscurity. 
So you've got this little little scene coming out into the darkness of the woodland beyond and the intruder, another outsider, coming in. Now the next page is interesting because this is not Hardy's writing. This is the writing of Emma Lavinia, his first wife. And she was at that time sympathetic still to what he was writing and she helped him by copying out some of the pages and some of the notes that he made. So we can see it's it's not unlike his writing. I think she tried to emulate his style so that there wasn't too much of a change. And um, so this is something. About 106 pages of the manuscript are in Emma's hand. So she was obviously very... In. And of course, given the pressure that he was under in writing this and getting it to the publishers, it's not surprising, is it, really? It's a good, a good helping thing that she did. So we've got... Um, this is Mr. and Mrs. Melbury, and Mr. Melbury's anxiety. He's spent all this money on his daughter, and he's promised her to Giles, a poor man. He's a terrible snob, and he's... I say terrible, that's not kind, but because he's not an unpleasant man, but he's a misguided man. And so she says, why should she be sacrificed to a poor man? It is not altogether a sacrifice, said the woman, that's his wife. He is in love with her, and he's honest and upright. If, the, if she encourages him, what can you wish for more? True, true, said Melbury. And I hope it will be for the best. Yes, yes. Let me get um, married up as soon as I can, so as to have it over and done with. <laughs> so it's an extraordinary attitude, isn't it, that he's got this uh, wanting to organise his daughter's life. But he does, she does challenge him later on and says that she... How dare he think of her as a mere chattel? So then we can get to Giles and Grace and this uh, extraordinary first meeting, which one would have thought was very hopeful. Um, But Giles seems to have this uh, rather languid indifference almost, although his feelings run deep. And it's interesting here, you've got the printer's mark in the left-hand corner. That's something the printer's written. Not quite sure whether it's his name, because they were responsible for sections of the manuscript when it went to the printers. And so the name of that group of the pages would have that person's name on it. And it's also got part two, as you can see, and chapter five. Now, this could be the beginning of part two in the serialisation in Macmillan's magazine. Winterbourne sped on his way to Shirton Abbas without... Oh, dear, we ain't. Without... I can't read it now. Ash. Detour. Is it detour? Thank you. Could be, couldn't it? Yes. Without detour and without... Discompose. No, I'm not sure. I, th- I did actually copy it out. What is it without something about discomposure? Yes. No, I didn't put that this. Right. Okay. So he's 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 going out by himself to collect uh, Grace because he's been asked to by her father, and. Um, Winterbourne sped on his way to Shirt Nabbas without elation, that's right, and without discomposure. Had he regarded his inner self spectacularly, as lovers are now daily wont to do, he might have felt pride in the discernment of a somewhat rare power in him, that of, not, of keeping not only judgment but emotion suspended in difficult cases. But he, did, but he noted it not. So that's a quite a sort of a strong uh, comment on him, isn't it? It doesn't. It's not expansive, but it says, "But he noted it not." So he's not really taking cognizance of the of the importance of this, or prepared to. 
put himself out. He goes in his rather scruffy clothes. He doesn't think about it. You know, you want to shake him, don't you? Anyway, that's beside the point. Now, here is a market scene. It's the one we've got of Dorchester. It's about 1830. Um, it's not the, in Sherborne, but it would have been like that. Busy and lots of stalls and lots of people around. And he, Giles, is standing there waiting for, for Grace to come. And we see her there first through the eyes of Marty South who has gone into the barber's with her hair cut off to give to him and she's standing there and she's looking across to the market scene and she spots Grace so we go across and um, she's also seen Giles and she sees his gaze turn towards the approaching Grace She followed his gaze and saw walking across to him a flexible young creature in whom she perceived... She perceived (laughs) the the feelings, the the, the features, sorry, the features, the features of her she had known as Miss... Grace Melbury, but now looking glorified and refined above her former level. Winterbourne, being fixed to the spot by his apple tree, could not advance to meet her. He held out his spare hand with his hat in it and, with some embarrassment, beheld her coming on tiptoe through the mud to the middle of the square where he stood. So he was a bit unlucky, wasn't he, really? And she's tiptoeing through the, through the mud, and he's standing there awkwardly, and he's trying to sell his apple trees, so he's got one in his hand and his hat in the other. Um, rather an awkward meeting. And then they have a rather disjointed conversation on the way home. And, as you know, his... his um, Attachment to her is stronger in his mind than it is in hers. And so he somehow thinks he must do something to attract her attention, and he decides to have a party, Um, which doesn't go all that well, does it? Um, It goes reasonably well, but they arrive very early, and the Melburys, although they're early and it's very awkward, they're extremely helpful. So there's, there's this sort of strange balance in the relationship between them accepting Giles, but they are patronising towards him, and he's not been accepted or invited into, his, into their house when he brought her home. He was more or less dismissed and had to wander off. So there is this sort of attitude, because Mr Melbury does regard him as a lesser mortal, it has to be said. Um, so after the party... We are confronted, we have uh, Mrs. Mr. Melbury um, talking about the party and about, uh, uh, about his feelings about Grace having been there. And afterwards, the second part is Giles considering the party. How did it go? He's asking Creedle, who's done all the, the cooking and everything and getting everything ready, and various rather clumsy things have happened. He, his mind reverted to the Giles, to Giles, Giles's party, and when they were nearly home, he spoke again. His daughter being a few steps in advance, it is hardly the, li- the line of life for a girl like Grace after what she's been accustomed to. So, and then we have Giles talking to Creedle. And he says, Creedle admits that there was a snail in the original um, manuscript that was uh, in the lettuce, or in the cabbage, I think it was, because it was cooked. And we we hear this episode in in the modern uh, versions, and it's usually a slug. So anyway, here we are. This one's a snail. What snail? Well, Maester, there was a little one upon the edge of her plate when I brought it out, and so it must have been in her few leaves of wintergreen. How the deuce 
Did a snail get there? That I don't know, no more than the dead. But there my gentleman was. So, not good news for Giles when he's reconsidering his, uh, his, uh, his party and the success or failure of it. Now, this is, uh, again, quite interesting because we've got um, uh, page 133A. So this is a whole um, rewriting of a section, and so Hardy's had to put another page in. And so we've got Woodlanders, and we've got part four, and August written against it. So we can probably, if we checked up, looked in Macmillan magazine for August, we probably would see that it started thus. And Wilson, again, this will be the, the, probably the, the name of the person who was setting up the print. So we've got chapter 14. So this is the part, this is just after Winterbourne, uh, Giles Winterbourne, and Mrs. Charmont has been taking the huge, big, heavy um, tree trunks through um, to, to the sawmills, I imagine, to be cut up, and his vehicle comes head to head with Mrs. Charmont's coach. She's in a hurry to get away, and they come together and she calls him that rude man but that rude man was doing his work he was within the woodland and uh, he has I think four horses all um, with the bars across to keep them together and they're pulling the logs through There's a great long entourage he has and so for him to turn around would be very difficult and for her to turn around in a little gig would be quite easy but she considers that he should turn around. It's this class thing back again, isn't it? I'm sorry, it's very small um, writing, but that's the event we've got here. And we've got quite a little bit of Hardy's extra uh, little pencil um, editions in there, which uh, you could see um, on the if, if we were to widen the screen, but I can't do it on that. Um, but it just, it's just another example. And you've also got some pencil writing in the left hand at the diagonal with the, where we've got 133. So there's a lot, of, a lot of story behind that page, although it's a scruffy one. This is just to give you an idea of the, the way it was. Single-sided um, pages, all bound up, nearly 500 of them all together. And uh, this is... Um, where um, where um, Giles and Grace are coming more, their relationship is, is going through a much better patch, really. And within it, um, Hardy says that if he was to um, liken Giles' feelings um, and, and he was... Uh, to a poet's feelings, he might, a modern poet might come up with this little rhyme, this little poem. If I forget the salt creek may forget the ocean. If I forget the heart whence flows my heart's bright notion, may I sink meanlier than the worst, abandoned outcast, crushed, accursed, if I forget. Though you forget, no word of mine shall mar your pleasure. Though you forget, you filled my barren life with treasure. You may withdraw the gift you gave. You still are queen, I still am slave, though you forget. So it does rather sum up um, the sort of person that Giles is, doesn't it? Does anyone recognise that poem? I think it's one of Hardy's little in-jokes. It's by Edmund Goss, so he's just slipped in a poem by one of his friends, which I think is is quite sweet. Um, But it does does do the job, doesn't it? It sums it up. So this is the piece which um, (coughs) Philip was referring to just now, the end of the the novel. Um, and it's Marty, she whispered. Now, my own, own love, she whispered. You are mine and only mine, for she has forgot he at last, although for, e- for her you died. But I, whenever I get up, I'll think of thee, 
And whenever I lie down, I'll think of thee. And whenever I plant the young larches, I'll think that no, none could plant as you planted. And whenever I split a gad, and whenever I turn the cider ring, I'll say, none could do it like you. If ever I forget your name, let me forget home, earth, and heaven. But no, no, my love, I never can forget he, for you was a good man and did good things. So that is the uh, sort of epitaph, if you like, at the very end of the novel. And um, I I don't know whether Philip will mind me reading something that he wrote when he edited the Wordsworth <laughs> um, edition of the novel, but it's I rather liked something he said at the end of the of his um, introduction. I can find it. Because I think in Hardy's novels one has a feeling not of finality very often, even in Tess. Okay, she's been hung, but people are walking away. They're walking away. Her sister's gone away and then is going away. And there is a story. There is life that carries on. And I think that's rather in this, um, in, in this idiom. So um, Philip was talking about the people who carry on life within the, within the, uh, the woodland scene again. And they will be telling stories. I know a man, a wife begins farmer courtry. I know a woman comes back, the bark ripper, trumping courtry's tail. And as they make their way home, we catch a last glimpse of the young woman seen at work by the fire. We know her name and her history. We know why the contours of womanhood will never be developed in her. Why she stands in the moonlight with a little basket of flowers in her clasped hands and whose grave she is preparing in to visit. In later years, we might imagine some other woodlander will begin, I know the woman, and tell the story of Marty South, memorialising her in the outcoming rays of his narrative, until his tale is completed and she too disappears again into the night. I think that's a lovely image to, to end up with. Um, thank you for that. And then I would just like to show you this last picture, which is um, a, a picture of Gertrude Bugler, who was the uh, very well-known actress who was the star, really, of the Hardy players originally. And her first real success, she was discovered as a very young girl, school girl, and uh, she was given the part of Marty South. And apparently they had, you know, not had high hopes of the production, of the, of the re- reception. And it was a real success because of the wonderful way that she interpreted the character of Marty. And uh, it, then she and some very far-sighted journalist reporting on the performance said, um, if, if she had done it so well that if one day they were to to dramatise Tess, that she would make the ideal Tess. And of course, that happened to be eventually what she was remembered for. So, anyway, thank you very much. It's just a taste of the. Helen said, please do feel free to go to the museum, simply show your lanyard, and you're more than welcome to go upstairs and see a section which has been created specifically to do with the novel, as well, of course, as the rest of the entire Hardy Gallery, obviously, his library from Maxgate, and the other manuscript holdings that we have there. Please feel free to go and see.